Welcome to Chess Dog. I'm John Montgomery, and today is a, a viewer request. In one of my other videos on Abhimanyu Mishra, a commenter, a viewer of the channel, pointed out that he was currently in Hungary trying to find that last Grandmaster Norm that he needs before uh, September 5th. And uh, would I cover one of those games? So I did a little research, found one very interesting game. And uh, again, of course, I'm covering Abhimanyu quite a bit, and I'll tell you why. Because I think the story is underreported, because we have so many incredibly strong chess players at such a young age, yet this record of being the youngest Grandmaster in history has stood for 18 years. Also, Abhimanyu's games are pretty entertaining, and this game is, uh, is no exception, and I, I hope you enjoy it. It begins, uh, his opponent, by the way, is named, forgive me for the pronunciation, I hope I get this somewhat right, Subramaniam Bharath, uh, an international master rated 2437. At the time of this game, Abhimanyu Mishra was rated 2485. Uh, this was played in June of this year. E4, C5, Abamanyu is has the black pieces. Knight F3, D6, D4. We have an open Sicilian. Knight F6, Knight C3, A6. The Nidorf, the Rolls Royce of defensive systems that you can play against E4. When a high-level player wants to win as black uh, against E4, not just draw, this is the best opening for that. White plays H3, an increasingly popular line against the Nidorf. He wants to play g4 and expand on the king's side. e5, a very common move in the knight orf. Black hits the knight at d4, kicking it away. Now, he creates a weakness in his own position at d5, but he also gains squares, control of f4, control of d4. And he says, well, I'm going to be able to keep the d5 square under control. I'm not that worried about it. The knight goes back to e2. What white wants to do is play g4, take that knight at e2, and move it over to g3 and use it in the attack. Abamanyu knows this, so he plays h5. So now white can't play g4. It would just be taken. White couldn't take back because of the pin down the h file. So white plays g3. The problem is that g3 pawn takes away the square that that knight on e2 wanted to be at. Uh, so he's limited in his scope right now. White wants to play bishop g2 control that d5 square further. Bishop e7, bishop g2, b5, gaining space on the queen side. White plays knight to d5. One of the ideas here is he wants to free up another square for that knight at e2 that's now short of squares and is very limited uh, at the moment. Knight takes d5, queen takes d5. Now the queen looks really strong on this square. It's well centralized. Um, the problem is that Black can later kick it out with tempo, but right now, white is threatening that rook on a8, so black moves it to a7. Bishop e3, white continues to develop with tempo, rook to b7. Now, this move looks awkward. Um, the more obvious move is to just play bishop e6 immediately and hit that queen on d2. Um, the problem with that is that black doesn't yet know what he wants to do with his bishop. And after queen d2, rook b7, knight c3, this game in the database, uh, white is actually doing very, very well here. Uh, after rook to b7, black, black is doing well, and he can choose what he wants to do with that bishop and that knight. Still has flexibility. Castles long. Subramanium castles to the queen side, right into black space. So this is, he's throwing down the gauntlet. He's saying, I'm going to be on the queen's side. I know your king's going over to the king's side. I'm going to attack you. You can attack me. Bring it on. I'm ready. Opposite side, castling. We're going at it. Knight d7, f4, continuing to generate uh, central and king side pressure. Black does castle short, as expected. And this is the first novelty of the game, the first new move that has never been played before. The terms have been set, kingside attack versus queenside attack. Queen to d2, moving away from d5 before black kicks the queen away on his own terms. Black plays b4, gaining space. f5, white does the same. 
Black plays rook to c7, lining up that rook against the king at c1, and also freeing up the b7 square for the bishop. The king moves away from that pressure, also defends the a2 pawn. Usually when white castles long, he has to play the king to b1 anyway. Bishop to b7. Abimanyu Ab Ab is targeting the pawn on e4, the weakest point in white's position. g4. White continues to expand on the king's side. Queen to a8. Creating a battery with that queen and bishop to go right after e4 and hit that e4 pawn. By the way, if you're getting value from this video, be sure to hit the like and subscribe button if you're not subscribed already. We greatly appreciate it. Now here, white plays g5, gaining more space on the king side. It perhaps might have been a better decision to play g takes h5, to take that pawn. The reason being that opens up the g-file, and he could place a rook on the g-file and, and attack through that file. But he decides to go ahead and gain the space instead. Uh, black plays rook f to c8, doubling up and attacking that c2 pawn on the half-open file. Now someone might ask, and it's a reasonable question, black is attacking e4 twice, and it's only defended once. So why not just capture on e4? Makes sense. Well, after bishop e4, queen e4, knight g3, hitting the queen, and queen to c6. Now, white can play this move that's very effective, f6. And he's hitting that bishop on e7 and the pawn on g7. And in a position like this, white doesn't care if he loses a pawn. All that matters is mate. And after gf6, knight f5, something like rook e8, defending the bishop, rook h to g1, uh, this attack is actually decisive. Uh, white would be winning in this position. So taking the pawn is still too dangerous. So black doubles up on the c-file, rook to c1, defending c2, bishop f8. Now that threat doesn't work anymore. If white plays f6, black will just play g6 and clog up the king side so that white can't open lines. So bishop f8, f8 pre prevents all of that nonsense. Queen to d3 to defend d4, because the previous variation that we looked at doesn't work. He has to defend d4 now. Rook to c4. Notice that. Queen, bishop, rook, targeting the weakest spot in white's position. Everything aiming towards that one weakness. Rook h to f1. Uh, now here, knight to g3, again defending the pawn a third time is probably better. Uh, white was probably worried about h4, kicking the knight. But as it turns out, um, and this would have been very hard to see during a game, your knight f1, bishop e4, bishop e4, queen to e4, knight d2. That knight forks the queen and the rook, which would force black to take white's queen in order to save the material. And after queen takes queen and everything exchanges on c1, uh, this endgame is fine for white. White's down a pawn, but he's got that space on the king side with the black weakness at h4. It's much easier for his king to enter the position. So this would have been a, a good endgame, a decent endgame for white, even though he's down a pawn. But he goes ahead and plays rook h to f1, giving the e4 pawn away. Bishop e4, bishop e4, queen e4. And now, the end game, white would be a pawn down if he took on e4, but he wouldn't have all of those advantages we just looked at. He would just be a pawn down. So now he avoids the, the end game, moves the queen to d2 h4. Controls that g3 square so the knight can't go to it. That knight on e2, this whole game has had a really hard time finding anywhere to go. Uh, so now, Subramanium tries to improve his worst placed piece, which is that knight on e2. Uh, first he plays f6. Black locks up the king side. Then knight to g1. But then black plays d5. And you can really see by just looking at this position, black is really taking control. White plays bishop f2, d4, and uh, we can basically look at this position. Black controls the center, black controls the queen side, and the king side, where white was hoping to attack, is completely locked up. There are no open lines over there, so black's advantage is, is quite clear. Queen to e2. At this point, white would be happy to go into an endgame. It would still be losing, but it would maybe relieve some of the pressure. Uh, but at this point, Abimanyu says, no, I've got too much pressure. I want to keep those queens on the board. 
Rook F E one, Bishop to D six, defending E five. There was a, an interesting computer variation, and this is the kind of move you really only see from computers. A uh, black could play Knight F six here. This would have been quite a good move. It looks like he's just losing a, a piece, but after pawn takes knight, bishop to h6, hits the rook on c1. That rook can't move because c2 would fall and his position would collapse. And after, say, knight f3, d3, queen takes is forced e4, and white's position would completely fall apart. But that's, of course, just an interesting variation from a computer. Bishop d6 helps to defend the e5 square. White just sort of tightens up, black marches, knight f3, a4, bishop e1. At this point, White's just hoping black makes a mistake. He puts the bishop in a very defensive position. b3, opening, trying to open up lines. c3, wanting to keep them closed. Bishop a2, check. Now, king to a1. It's not good enough here, but it is an interesting idea that can have some practical value. White wants to use black's own pawn against him. So now black's pawn on e2 creates something of a shield for the king at a1. Again, it's too little too late, but it is an interesting strategic concept. Rook to c5. Black is preparing to play a4, a3, trying to open up more lines. White grabs the loose pawn at h4. a3, again, b3. Uh, white wants to keep lines closed at all costs. Knight to b6. Now that knight is finally going to come in into the game. He wants to play knight d5, knight c3. Queen c2, controlling a bit of the c3 square. Um, also, maybe hoping for a sacrifice on g6, but again, that, that wouldn't uh, amount to anything. Black wouldn't have to take the offered piece. Knight to d5, queen e4, Maybe exchange queens, who knows? Knight takes c3, queen c6, rook h c6, and uh, this is completely losing at this point. We'll look at the rest of the moves. Rook to d3, knight goes to e4, rook c5, knight c5, threatening the rook and the b3 pawn. If black plays the rook to g3, then e4, and there are no squares available on the rank, and he would lose the pawn. He sees this, so he goes ahead and plays rook to d1 immediately. Knight b3 check, king a2. Knight c1 check, king a1. Rook to c2, king to b1, d3. And after rook takes d3, knight takes d3, king takes c2, knight e1 check. He's up a piece, and after king to b3, bishop to c5. And you see that knight on h4 literally has nowhere to go. Black is just going to play bishop f2, bishop takes knight, uh, and that would be, of course, the end of the game. And here, a white resigned. So I think this is another example of the tremendous talent that Abhimanyu Mishra has. And uh, again, if you enjoyed the video, click the like button and be sure to subscribe if you haven't. Thank you for joining us at Chess Dog. Goodbye.